welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. I'm Manoj Keval Ramani and today I have with me my colleague Pranay Kothasthane and we're going to be talking about a new year with the same old problem. Over the last few weeks there's been lots of talk in India once again about the trade and economic dependence that we have on China. Early in December there was a question put during the parliament session in the Rajya Sabha to which the Ministry of Commerce responded with data about India's economic dependence on China. So I'll just read out some of that data to you. India's trade with China in the fiscal year 2021-2022 was at $115 billion. The trade deficit was $73.3 billion. In the fiscal 2022-2023, this trend is likely to continue because already our trade is at $69 billion. And we've seen the trade deficit hit 51.5 billion. So the trend seems to be continuing and that's prompted again calls for some sort of decoupling, some sort of reduction of dependence. There have been articles written which talk about how we have X thousand Chinese individuals on boards of companies in India. These can be multinational companies or whatever. And there's talk about, you know, how we are sort of locked in this economic entanglement with China and we need to break through that. And every time this conversation comes up is largely in the context of also when tensions along the border have escalated. So in the last few weeks, we've also had this standoff, uh, this incident, not a standoff in Yangtze in Arunachal Pradesh. So I wanted to talk to Pranay about this particular issue and beginning with the idea that two years ago, when the Eastern Ladakh standoff started and the Indian government took steps in the economic realm along with military steps. We banned a couple of Chinese apps. We ensured that Huawei and ZTE were out of our 5G ecosystem. And also in the last few months, eight months to the last year, we've seen lots of investigations against Chinese companies in India. So, and there's been some celebration of this fact that we've got this new sort of weapon, for the lack of a better word, in our toolkit. So I wanted to firstly ask you about this. Is our ability to use economics and trade and investment as a strategic tool with China. Firstly, do we have sufficient in that toolkit? And secondly, is it useful? Yeah, so Sao Shanghao, Manoj, we should begin by uh, saying good morning in Mandarin. But uh, I was just thinking about this. So I think there's a lot of literature on trade deficits and their utility or not so uh, much utility in the international realm. But generally, the accepted idea is that looking at trade deficits on a country to country basis is not a very useful instrument from an economic point of view because it might be a problem but solving it by saying that we will not buy from you is not the right solution so it is it's like many things the problem definition is right but the solution when you attack it directly is not effective the reason i say that is the trade deficit exists for a reason right it exists because there is it is more competitive to make something in china and it is more competitive to make something else in India. So if you are going to force fit things and try to make them in India, then obviously there are other reasons why it's not being made. So either you need to solve those problems or you need to give those that money over and over every year in order to make up for that cost disability. Right. So, for instance, there was a statement, I think, a couple of years ago by the finance minister that why are Ganesha idols not made in India and why are they imported from China? Right. So it's not as if someone is deciding a consumer that I want to buy something from China. Right. There's a reason why those POP uh, Ganesha idols which are made are cheaper in China and they are not in India. The ones which are made in clay will in India will be costlier, etc. So, People don't prefer that, right? So that is the reason why this trade deficit overall exists. And so that, that is one reason, right? So uh, I think we need to be very careful when we look at these broad trade deficit numbers and worry about them with China or with any other country. You know, it's okay. Let's There's not, no problem with having a trade deficit. 
And I say that in many countries, for example, US and China are the world's largest exporters. They are also the world's largest importers. Yeah. Taiwan also imports. Uh, Taiwan's biggest import is chips, right? Yeah. It's, even though its biggest export is also that. So there will be these dependencies and it's not that much of a problem. Where I would say with China, we should probably worry about things is look very narrowly at commodities that we are importing from China for which there is no other alternative from the world, right? No viable alternative. There probably we have a risk because yeah, if China tomorrow stops supply for one or the other reason, it will hurt them as well, but it might hurt us more. So we need to be careful. So for instance, I'll give you examples of both, right? So EV cells, now EV cell chemistry and the entire uh, supply chain, even if the EV cells are being made in uh, Australia, a lot of of the ownership as you know is Chinese yeah. right so and there are no viable alternatives as of now good viable alternatives for the lithium ion uh, battery so maybe that is one concern but I'll give an alternative where it doesn't work so display panels for example we have a big PLI for that 12,000 crores plus etc because we do buy a lot of display panels from China right now but there are also alternate suppliers so yeah. Japan supply South Korea supply so if tomorrow China doesn't supply big deal you know like I mean uh, there will be other suppliers the cost will be higher but cost will be higher even if we make here so so i think the reason is we think of this trade deficit with an adversary at a very macro level and then say all trade deficit is bad and hence we need to do something and uh, now this is one argument right there are other people who will also say that trade deficit is actually a strength right because you are actually a buyer and if you are a big market you are a buyer you actually have the leverage yeah. because tomorrow if you stop buying from that country there will be uh, economic interest which will suffer there right? yeah. so I think these are uh, frames of references to look at trade deficit instead of just looking one big macro number and assuming that that will suddenly make it zero or close to zero at some point yeah I think that, you know, I want to pick on two points that you said. One is the idea that we need to look at trade and the deficit. I mean, we need to look at dependencies versus vulnerabilities, right? So dependencies, like you said, mm. those LED panels, those are for businesses as opposed to strategically for the state per se. And it's fine for businesses to go and find their solutions. So in case there is a supply chain disruption in China, let's say because of COVID again right now, Businesses should go, be free to go and look at alternatives and what policy should do is to try and facilitate that process through other means than say necessarily subsidies. Whereas vulnerabilities may be different. So the EV cells may be a vulnerability because it's an industry that you want to grow. It's your future, you know, energy source and all of that. Whereas this is something that maybe, you know, business. so it's useful also to sort of define different sectors and aspects of different sectors in which you want the state to intervene. For example, I don't see why... The state needs to intervene in the toy industry or in, say, even white goods in general. There's no real need. If you're getting cheaper alternatives from China, it's perfectly fine. There's a consumer welfare aspect to it, which we should be okay with. In that, if there is a certain strategic vulnerability that comes across because of certain components, that's, I think, something for the state to intervene. Otherwise, I see very little reason for the state to get involved. Uh, and we'll talk about the PLI schemes in detail. Uh, so we'll talk about where all the state is getting involved. So, Manoj, just to add, that is a good distinction between dependency and vulnerability. And there's a lot of work on this. Uh, there's Richard Baldwin, who's done a like, lot of work on global supply chains. And maybe we can link to his articles. Yeah. They're like foundational study material on what global supply chains are, what are the risks. So he says similar things, right? Like in the sense that there are risks in global supply chains now and firms also factor that in. It's yeah. not as if that firms are, will be unaware of this, right? Yeah. But there are certain, only cer certain areas in which or conditions under which firms might not do optimal risk measurement and so for one example is information asymmetry. For example, the small Indian firms or in India might not have enough data or even the wherewithal to know where their intermediate supplies are coming on, right? So maybe then there is a make sense for government to reduce that information asymmetry at least make them aware yeah. in one way or the other that you know actually your commodities are bought from a dealer who buys from China and there are risks etc maybe yeah. like foreign pharma API chain etc it might make sense yeah. right so there is an information asymmetry uh, problems second it might just be that they they are just too small so again there might be uh, the socially optimal way of them doing risk mitigation might be 
much much higher than their capability right so there again there might be government requirement so there are specific conditions under which the risk mitigation which firms already do hmm. and they are more uh, concerned about this than the government or a consumer would be right so they do that but there will be certain conditions in which government intervention in one way or the other makes sense hmm. but not in all right? not so, all. yeah all right so i wanted to sort of go back to the idea of the trade deficit yeah, in the reply that the Commerce Ministry gave to the Rajya Sabha, it sort of said something really interesting. At one level, there is this conversation about reducing dependency, reducing vulnerability. Uh, at this other level, we are obviously seeing the trade overall go up, irrespective of what the deficit is. But this is what the Commerce Ministry said, and I'm going to quote them. Most of the goods imported from China are capital goods, intermediate goods, and raw materials, and are used for meeting the demand for of fast expanding sectors like electronics, telecom and power in India. The rise in import of electronic components, computer hardware and peripherals, telephone components, etc. can be attributed to transforming India into a digitally empowered society and a knowledge economy. So in some, what we are basically seem to be saying here is that the imports are actually beneficial to us. Hmm. So to constantly say that this trade deficit is a strategic vulnerability that needs to be addressed. There are some commentators who will make the claim that we are funding our own containment by China by, you know, furthering hmm. this trade deficit. This from the government, it basically says that, look, this is not the case. You know, yes, we're doing this, but we're also gaining from it. And this is a narrative which is has completely gotten lost out despite the government actually saying this. Hmm. So I, ju- I just find that fascinating that, you know, yeah. it's there's an acknowledgement of the fact that if yeah. India needs to become digitally empowered, India needs to become a modern economy, it needs these inputs. Right, absolutely right. And like the way, uh, one more way to look at it is if you look at our India's imports, top all our energy things, then there is gold, diamond, yeah. then there is notebooks, computers, telephone equipment, which includes mobile phones, routers and chips. So these are the top eight of our dependencies, right? And yeah, energy, you can leave them out, but phones, telephone or chips, all of them largely are coming from Hong Kong or China. Yeah. Right? So, yeah, I mean, if you get cheap of those, you are actually benefiting a lot of people, right? So, that is one thing. And second thing, right, like that argument which you said, funding China, mm. that would make sense if India were India's China's biggest uh, importer, right? Like, but I think last when I had checked, India was 2% of all of China's exports. Yeah. I don't know if that is yeah, around 2 to 3%. Yeah, so, I mean, how is it that that 2% percent is funding whole of China. I mean, you you have a exaggerated sense of your own importance to China at this point, right? So, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we do matter, but it's not as if just because of we stopped sub- getting phones from them means that China will be a, a lesser power and with their border tensions will stop. It's not happening. And, and I also think it, it sort of that argument completely overlooks the fact that if your economic engagement reduces dramatically to the point where it is negligible it reduces the incentive yes while there is conflict can still take place at high levels of economic engagement but it reduces the incentives to not intensify conflict right i mean I, yes i do think that china's uh, the pla incursions uh, in eastern ladakh and in arunachal and the intensification of presence along the boundary um is a decision that's been taken respective of whatever our trade is. But the fact that if you have deeper trade, it does mitigate, it does increase the risk of conflict, it does increase the cost of conflict. Mm-hmm. And I think that complete that narrative has gotten so completely lost that we assume that states are no longer taking... And again, I think that if you look at what's happened between the US and China, one of the reasons that it has been difficult for the United States to do what it's wanted to do for the last five, seven years is because there is deep business investments. There is deep stake involved. Your supply chains are intermingled. So it's actually quite, if you decouple or if you become Atma Nirbhar in whatever sense you want from the world or from one, from your biggest neighbor, it actually increases your, it creates greater instability in your security environment as a whole, as opposed to stability. If you are intertwined and intermingled, it's still increases the cost of conflict. And I think you've made this argument, you know, when you talked about how some of the lessons that Indian commentators seem to be drawing from the semiconductor tiff between the US and China. And you made this argument saying that, look, actually, deeper engagement has meant, it made it much more difficult to actually decouple, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the way I put it is, we need Atma Shakti, not Atma Nirbharta, right? And I think government also uh, gets it sometimes. So there are many views, right? One view is that, yeah, we need to just reduce our import dependence on all these things. But the other import also, they realize that you can't do that without being integrated into global supply chains. You can't have semiconductor manufacturing like a steel industry on the 50s that you can have one national champion who does everything and you have the steel product which will come out from the mine, do all the processing 
thing and then yeah. have an alloy and all that that does can't happen in one country today in for example if you want to make a chip you will have comparative advantage based specialization yeah. to make it cost effective you will have to engage with other world so i think to we are looking at a wrong frame if we think in terms of only national champions and national industry there is in all advanced tech or even technology there is no national industry there is only global supply chain yep. and you need to find your place in this global supply chain the thing that you can do well add value com- better compared to the others and make money there that's the way it is okay so let's talk about atma shakti and one of our biggest tools for building atma shakti or atma nirbharta as the government talks about is uh, this production linked incentive schemes uh, if i'm correct and you, uh, you can correct me if i'm wrong uh, i think the first of these was in 2020 hmm. and then subsequently they've been expanded to other sectors and right now we have about 14 sectors which are covered and there's talk of more sectors being covered if I recall again correctly the idea was that you're going to create national champions and you're going to create X number of jobs in India to boost Indian manufacturing one of the things that we always hear when people write about reducing your dependence on China is to enhance domestic manufacturing and that's been a huge issue beyond just the China factor also that in India we need to boost manufacturing so I want to firstly sort of get your take on how do these schemes function Hmm. Because even when I've read about them, I've ended up getting quite confused. Hmm. So how do these schemes function? What's the objective? And then we'll talk about how they're doing. Right. So production linked incentives, I've been following that first one written about in November 2020. So more than two years ago was the first one where they had an electronics one and then they had added 10 sectors. And after that, it became 13 and now it is 14. Now production linked incentive, as the name suggests, it is an incentive. It is basically a cashback that you get based on producing something okay Hmm. so there is a first a cap for you to invest in a country now you can be a domestic or a foreign player Hmm. as long as you do production in India you are you are eligible for that so what they do is so maybe you have to invest X amount of X crores capital investment Hmm. and there's a cap for that so Hmm. if you meet that condition Hmm. then for every incremental sale that you do Hmm. of that product you will get a cash back on that so it is 4 to 6 percent so let's say in year after investment of that capital you made 1000 crore sales in this year so the f- it's varies between 4 to 6 percent so 6 percent of that 1000 crores you government will give you okay okay so that is what it is so it's a cash back for producing out of india okay okay it's simple terms that is what production link incentive is now it is designed well in the sense that one if we would have called it an export subsidy so these can the products can be final products can be exported they can be consumed domestically it's all fine yeah export subsidies are not allowed under wto okay so they would have been banned so that's why intelligently it has been designed that this is not an export subsidy it is for domestic for export it can be anything yeah so this is an industrial policy measure that we have used so i think and the way it works is that there are different ministries who are in charge of this for the electronics ministry there is an advisory committee which sits on it which looks at you know whether the investment the cap for investment has been met then there are it sounds okay in the 10,000 feet level but there will be several challenges right so for example the investment that you make in people the investment that you make in uh, non-capital expenditure is not counted under this right so then uh, someone has to investigate whether the government is whether the company is investing here so there will be some check for that so there will be an advisory there will be a committee which will decide whether a company meets these Mm. criteria so you submit all your uh, applications someone will assess whether you meet that criteria then once you are accepted and then you are actually able to increase your sales and there is an incremental sales number which comes at the end of the year you get that cash back Mm. so that's how like it operates okay so that so that makes sense and it it sounds fairly sound, hmm. right, that you would do this. But you've written about the fact that, you know, there are quite a few challenges in terms of, you know, what would it mean for broader reform to expand these peers? And we're seeing them expanded, like you said, right? It started with one sector, then 10, now 14. And the latest, like I said earlier, I've been reading about the toy industry potentially yeah. getting a PLI scheme. Is it valuable to be expanding it across the board in this sense? Sir? Yeah, no, absolutely not. So let's look at it in some more detail now, right? So first of all, what is the stated intent? Now, I went to the 
press release when in just read this i'm quoting from it they have been specifically designed to boost domestic manufacturing in sunrise and strategic sectors curb cheaper imports and reduce import bills improve cost effectiveness of domestically manufactured goods and enhance domestic capacity and exports now if you can show me one policy which does all of so, that so it is it is a brahmastra yeah. so that i think is the central challenge because we don't know what we want to achieve from hmm. it okay so there is like too many things we want to achieve from yeah. one policy instrument and that is always a recipe for failure because you can add your favorite objective to it and then forget about the core objective for which it started right so that is one thing so the analogy i try to give for this is it is like applying a bandaid on a bullet wound mm-hmm. so you can't expect to apply many many bandaids on a bullet wound and expect that it will heal on itself right yeah. you have to do something yes. to solve the problem internally so yeah. i think P- PLI is a mandate which is required in certain sectors now purely because from an economics perspective my thinking has changed on it initially uh, the, all the things that I've written are like PLI shouldn't have existed mm. but I think given the international environment where every other country also has a industrial policy yeah. now we are not in the heady or uh, days of the world trade organization yeah. and everyone is having some sort of an incentive so you have to play the game to be in the game right and also the fact that now there's an opportunity they every many companies are looking at least for a china plus model yeah. so what can you do at this moment quickly what is the quick bandaid that you can apply now to stop the bleeding yeah maybe pli does that right mm. so in certain sectors to me it makes sense now let's look at the reasons right i just gave you like broader reasons from the press release but let's look at it systematically so one reason that it began with was we need to increase our exports yeah sound reason i think india needs to increase exports in lot of manufacturing sector and if we inc- are able to export well then our quality also improves right because we are competing with uh, world players we are not yeah. just looking at uh, import substitution so that is one but now because it actually stated intent itself is so wide it can be interpreted in other ways right mm. so sometimes in cer- certain sectors exports is not the most important goal so it becomes an infant industry argument which yeah. has been there since 1950s that we say there are certain industries where we need to help our small domestic players and they will not be able to compete so we will help them in that and hopefully they'll then become competitive right yeah. so an example of this is drones yeah. so for example not only do we have a pli on drones we have banned import of any drones yeah. in india right yeah. uh, import of certain drones that we have banned like so why is that right yeah. so pli often comes if you shift the goal yeah. that it's not increasing exports but the goal is for me to actually develop my own industry then you can add many things to apart from pli so yeah. in certain sectors we see that happening right the third reason can be strategic right now again this is this term is not the right term to use <laughs> but because you can apply like you can say semiconductor are strategic but there are that entire supply chain involves i mean intel has 16000 suppliers there are so many stages yeah. if you look at entire thing as semiconductor is strategic you will end up spending massive money without gains right yeah. so you might have to look at so but that is a valid reason that there are certain things which are strategic yeah. and for them you need to sort of back government money gone there yeah. is value so maybe what you need to do there is identify narrowly even in semiconductors what is our comparative advantage yeah. what is the place we can occupy which no one else can and then we have disproportionate leverage hmm. in that so right that is one argument so certain in for certain sectors it has been used because of this reasoning then the fourth reasoning is self reliance mm. right and then self reliance specifically is reduce imports right mm. that it becomes the goal and a subset of that is reduce dependence on china or reduce imports from china right? yeah. now when you think of that lens along with plis you will have import tariffs so yeah. you will increase import tariffs and that's what we've been doing in electronics there is something called the phase manufacturing program the idea was that we will first charge very high import tariffs on uh, consumer goods so hoping that we will be able to produce the phone in india even yeah. though we'll import all commodities from china or elsewhere but we'll make the phone that will be competitive with the now hi- heavily in- imported tariff imported phone then over time we will then uh, keep uh, raising import tariffs for the intermediate products yeah. so then okay first phone then charger then phone pcb then phone you know uh, display panel hmm. so that 
that's was the idea so once you combine you think from that lens import tariffs uh, uh, etc become important that has actually hurt us because yeah. a lot of money that mobile manufacturers in india are getting through pli are actually going in paying the higher import tariffs for intermediate companies so it's essentially going back to the government yes <laughs> yeah so th- there's no gain right yeah. so it's like so that's one then there are at least three implicit reasons I can think of. These one implicit reason, for example, Rakesh Mohan, who's at CSEP and uh, has written a lot about this subject. So he says one implicit reason why we have had to do PLI now is because of our overvalued exchange rate. Right? Hmm. So because we had higher import tariffs over the last decade and our exchange rate is also overvalued, our exports are not competitive. Yeah. And the only way to make exports competitive in this scenario was then and because we don't want to let the exchange rate move freely it was then to give some artificial incentive or a nudge which is this Mm. so that is one another implicit reason I think and which makes sense is to increase private sector investment we've over the last 10 years it's the Puja Mehra etc called the, the last decade and it's quite relevant because private sector investment has dropped since 2011 right yeah. so you need to increase private sector investment this is clearly for that reason right and yeah the last implicit reason as I told you was all other countries are doing some industrial policy we have to be in the game so we are doing these things so these are like all the set of reasons which sort of plain but I, the one point I want to highlight is that one the money that we are putting in this is finally your and my money Hmm. or it is the money which are borrowing from your children's generation right so it's not government's money it's our money so the idea is that you would want to first identify a narrower set of sectors you would want to back them to the hilt like maybe you want to give bigger incentives to them and then limit yourself to that right because marginal cost of public finance would tell you that every rupee government raises the cost to society is rupees three like what Kelkar and Shah write in their book. Hmm. So the benefit from that sector should be more than rupees three, not yeah. more than rupee one. And I don't think we are doing that. So that's where your toy yeah. example comes in. Yeah. Is the benefit to the toy industry from this PLI more than uh, rupee three for every rupee one that government is spending? I don't think so. Right. Hmm. So maybe th- those are the kinds of things. At least you need to do an analysis. I don't yeah. know where it would be. Though. So the opportunity cost of every rupee spent in a country which is two thousand dollar per capita is very high yeah and we should be very careful of where that uh, money is going yeah i mean I, I i completely agree with you because when i was reading through this details um, my sense was also that look firstly again like you said we have too many objectives and secondly you need to have narrower definitions of what a sec what within a sector is it that you want to do mm. because in all of this i think we also end up losing any sense of what consumer welfare is you know It's great if people have cheap mobile phones. It's great if people have cheaper white goods. I don't see why the lens of everything is so state centric that you end up losing any sort of conversation about consumer benefit and consumer gain. And I think that it's a it it seems like a lost cause in this generation where there's so much of you know strategic and state view. No, I absolutely agree. And one point I want to make is that countries don't trade, people do, right? Exactly. (laughs) We are buying things. It's not the countries which are trading. So their interest is important. And I think Vivek Call had a very nice article on the mobile manufacturing thing. And the point he was making is mobile phones itself, if you look at any electronics goods, they decline in price very very quickly, right? Mm-hmm. Because a new tech comes and the old phone is just... But if you would have realized over the last seven or eight years, mobile phone prices haven't dropped significantly. Yeah. So actually, they should have dropped a lot. If you look at any electronics, goods, that was the case. Yeah. But they haven't dropped. And one reason is because a consumer welfare and consumer surplus has reduced through import tariffs, through yeah. all these things. It is now much costlier. And that's why the prices are stagnant. So yeah, absolutely agree. Consumer welfare is a a big point that we shouldn't lose sight of. Okay, my last question to you is uh, around the next year. I'm sure that by by January we'll get you know nine month data, and by April we'll get by April May June we'll get the annual data. And again, the trade deficit will be quite high. This conversation will continue in terms of you know our trade deficit being high despite you know border tensions escalating. Is there a short run fix to this or do we have to play the long haul game and accept the fact that while 
we use these schemes, we use other methods to try and build our resilience for en- enterprises and from a state perspective, that this is something that is structural, it's going to continue. And in fact, while we continue, while we try to build our resilience and Atma Shakti, it's likely to worsen. Mm. Is that something that we're likely to see over the next year or two? Or, you know, unless we take something, some drastic measures, which will come with tremendous pain also, Mm. uh, not just to the consumer, but also to the industry. So I wanted to get your sense on that. Okay, so first, this is a prediction (laughs) and I'm going on on a limb. The imports from China next year will increase Mm. from what they are now. Because if we are doing more manufacturing in India, we'll actually end up buying more intermediate goods and it's it will be China, other countries. But so that let's see how that plays out. So it's not going to go away in the Mm. short term. But let's look at the alternatives, right? So one I think let's look at first very narrowly for certain sectors where you think these this is a national mission is required. You know, mm. government thinks these are of supreme critical importance. I would go one step further. You don't need to do PLI, you do upfront capital investment like mm. they have done for say a semiconductor fab. Yeah. I think one fab we need to have at least to know what it takes. Okay, I wouldn't argue that for a display fab. I don't care if my display fab comes from China or Taiwan. But chip is useful to know. There are many externalities. We need to uh, get there. So there I would say government should look at not just a production link, which is a cash bag, but like what it has done now that for every rupee the private sector puts, government is willing to back one rupee there. Right. So especially for these kinds of sectors where the production will will happen only five, six years down the line. So no one is going to invest today because you're going to give some money six years down the line. So maybe for a very narrow set of things, we could identify upfront capital investment. Second alternative, and this is from the book that Gautam Bambavle, Ambassador Gautam Bambavle, uh, Ajay Shah and others have written on, can we sort of think of a procurement solution for certain things? So for example, they were talking about the pharma APIs in China. So now we are dependent we import a lot of farm IPS. What is the good way of doing that? Now, the same solutions will be do PLI, others, etc. But they conceptualize one alternative where we say that, you know, there is for the next five years, we identify first critical APIs from China. Hmm. And then we identify that for the next five years, we'll increase, we'll procure domestically by foreign player, Indian player, doesn't matter, which will keep increasing over time. So let's say if we are buying a Q amount from uh, China right now, first year we'll import, domestically we'll procure 0.1 Q, next year 0.2 Q, 0.3 Q, so on. So So this increasing, you know, upfront commitment encourages companies to invest, right? And this is an upfront procurement. And once that procurement happens, the products will actually be costlier than the world market price because we are still learning are so that we can auction it off so yeah. we don't need to actually consume so the only objective of this is to build domestic muscle to learn and there's no other objective yeah. you know there's uh, no export objective nothing yeah. no import substitution now if you build that muscle after five years you will have out of those 50 APIs you have selected some of the APIs you would have gotten better at it gotten cost competitive at it etc so that's one more way. Probably now I was thinking this can be applied to certain other sectors, yeah. right? So again, this is requires high state capacity, but this is another old. And the third one is, yeah, like we were discussing, narrow down PLIs, identify commodities which don't have alternate supplies, which mm. are then become probably a vulnerability and yeah. not a dependency. And then finally, yeah, there are a lot of underlying issues, which as I said, the bandit can't solve the bullet wound. So so what Rakesh Mohan talks about exchange rate, electricity costs in India are the high, some of the high, most high in the world. You know, yeah. these are not just the price that we pay, but there are also costs that consumers pay. It's unreliable, so consumers have to do captive power generation. So electricity is not under GST. Yep. Our tax rates are four rates. Uh, litigation, those things we need to solve. Like I think the we would be doing a disservice if we think that because we have fifty sectors, clearly we have PLIs, yeah. our problems will get solved. No, they won't. Right? Some PLIs will end at some time, and yeah. at that time, who are you? Who? How will the companies run? So those things we still need to solve, and there's no shortcuts for that. 
All right. So you heard it here first. There are no shortcuts to achieving these objectives. And there's a long road to go. And some of the ideas that we've discussed, hopefully, you know, if you guys have thoughts and if you guys uh, would like to work on some of these ideas uh, with us, uh, do please reach out to us. We'd be happy to have a conversation. We are, we look at this objective of trying to build Atma Shakti, like Pranay said, as a strategic objective from an Indian interest perspective. And, you know, if you're from industry, if you're a researcher, if you are somebody who has a sense of how some of these things can be done, please feel free to write to us it'd be a pleasure to engage thank you so much Pranay Jai Jain if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network you can tune into them on the IVM podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow IVM on social media the handle is at IVM podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.